quite steadily over the last couple of years. The arts have been gaining a fierce foothold in Boston. Adventurous theater companies spring up while the big guys send shows to Broadway. Local artists are gaining international attention and public art just received some major financial backing per order of the governor. In fact, Greater Boston has more arts and cultural groups per capita than any other U.S. city with 18 million people annually attending arts events. That's four and a half more times than the number of people who attend the games of all four professional sports teams combined. Now the focus of arts and culture in Boston is entering new territory with the first ever cabinet level chief of arts and culture. Julie Burroughs, already known around the city as the arts czar, started exactly 15 days ago, arriving here from Chicago, where she was director of cultural planning. Welcome. Thank you, Jared. So I'll give you a little bit of a pass because I know you're, you're only <laughs> just getting into the job and I know you're trying to be everywhere at once, but uh, you, you were announced by the mayor to be the new art czar a few months ago and you've had a chance to look at the city of Boston. What is the state of the art here, do you think? Well, I'm still in my reconnaissance mode and my listening tour and learning about things. And so I'm listening really carefully to what people say. Different people are saying different things. That's what I'm noticing the most. And so I'm starting to weed through what's perception and what's reality. And that's gonna be a big part of my first several months on the job, is really gaining a deep understanding of the arts community here. Are there specific things that you're looking and listening for? Yeah. I'm trying to listen to what's the common thread, what are the most commonly stated challenges and issues, what are people within Boston saying, and I'm very interested to hear sort of what are people outside of Boston saying, what's the perception, how are things perceived. And I think that sometimes people uh, internalize uh, that outside image um, and, and that becomes reality. It's repeated again and again and I'd like to kind of cut through and really understand um, what's the real deal. So what do you think are, are some of the, the problems that are surfacing when people are assuming some of those images that you were just talking about? Well, one of the things I hear is that things are maybe a little parochial and stodgy, and I, I don't find that to be the case at all. I'm, I'm finding that that's maybe an old um, image of Boston, an old image of the arts community here. I think it's very young and vital, and um, I'd like to transmit that accurate image of Boston. So what's really exciting you as you're starting to attend events and, and meeting artists and seeing artist groups? Well, the biggest thing is is just how welcoming people are. You know, it, people always say, oh, Midwesterners are so friendly. You know, <laughs> the East Coast people are gonna be a little frosty and it's gonna take time for them to warm up to you and um, just be prepared for that. That's what everybody told me. But I've really found everybody tremendously welcoming, super friendly. Everybody wants to be my friend. <laughs> <laughs> because we all want something. <laughs> well, I'm gonna use it to my full advantage and really um, I've been meeting with people, you know, hey, I just wanna pick your brain. You know. Everybody says you know so much about this field or that field and let's sit down and have a coffee and, and let me pepper you with a million questions because I just want to get up to speed as fast as I can. Well, I want to ask you about Chicago because I have always on this show and other platforms held up Chicago as what this city should be. I spend a fair amount of time there mm. and I love Millennium Park. I love the public art. We're looking at the Cloud Gate by Anish Kapoor there and some of the other public art pieces there. Chicago is known for being a brilliant mm -hmm. art city. Yeah. What do you want to take from Chicago and bring to Boston? Yeah, I think there's a receptivity for public art and risk taking that I'd like to see Boston embrace. Uh, there's uh, new, new ways we can go about public art that are more of the um, temporary projects that uh, really have less of a maintenance uh, burden for the city to look at. And so I think that that would be very exciting to bring to Boston. Yeah, the governor recently signed an order uh, that I referenced in the introduction, which will pr put aside a percentage of, of new projects mm -hmm. in a number of cities around the Commonwealth, including Boston, for public art. We don't have enough of that in the city, public mm -hmm. art. So how are you going to leverage what the governor has just done and this desire to have more public art mm -hmm. uh, for the city? Yeah, um, so that's a percent for art program, which the city of Boston does not have. And so we're going to look at that. Is that the right model to institutionalize funding public art? It might be the right model, but we don't necessarily have to wait for an ordinance or legislation. We can try some pilots to see, can we voluntarily opt for a small percentage of a budget to be spent on public art? And again, it doesn't necessarily have to be a mosaic on the wall or a sculpture in the lobby 
happy. It can be something that's maybe a dance performance. Maybe we involve our new poet laureate. We do something that's a temporary, more, um, more uh, experiential kind of approach to public art. What are some of the other disciplines you're looking at right now? We've become really known as a theater town, mm -hmm. from just the, the fringe theater springing up to, as I mentioned, places like the Huntington in Boston, the ART right across the river, technically not in your purview, but mm -hmm. sending shows to Broadway. But then we've also ha seen theater companies lose their space mm -hmm. here. The factory theater just closed, and suddenly a yeah. young group of artists who had this raw space in which to work lost that space. And I know that's one of the biggest complaints is that young people don't have a place to work. Mm -hmm. I am hearing about the space issue again and again and again, not only for theaters, but for performing arts of all sorts, for art, individual artists, for the visual arts, for galleries. So that is one of the through lines I'm picking up loud and clear. I know that that's a big, big issue. But for theater in particular, I'm a huge fan of theater, big, big theater goer in Chicago, so I can't wait to start going to see shows. Um, just in the few weeks I've been here, I've only seen mostly holiday productions. That's pretty much what's happening now during the holiday season. So I'd like to get out and see the work, get out and see the venues, meet with people today. I had lunch with someone, uh, a young theater company person who was eager to just fill me in. What do you need to know? What do you want to know? And I could ask, you know, to completely pick his brain and ask him about, um, you know, who's doing what, what kind of work do you see? What are the issues? Who's, um, who's, who's up and coming? Who are the established players? Does the city need to become a big, splashy arts player like Chicago? Is that the way to get a city to become a major, major art city? You know, this is a really uh, key issue that I'm going to be delving into. And what is the appropriate role for government to play in the support of the arts within Boston and in greater Boston in the arts ecosystem, really, because the arts energy flows across borders. It doesn't know, you know, audiences come from all over, creative people live all over our region. And so it really is one ecosystem. Uh, and I wanna really look at what is the appropriate role of government. I've been looking at models from other places and there is not one size fits all. And so that's really part of what we're gonna be looking at when we do our cultural plan understanding what are the needs and what's the best possible role for government to play in really supporting the cultural field, not necessarily being a lead producer of arts and culture. Funding is going to be massive in your job. I looked at the job description when it was posted, and a lot of it is about fundraising. Mm -hmm. And I know, again, I keep going back to Chicago, but I know public-private partnerships are very successful there, not always successful here. Mm -hmm. So how is money going to be central to what you're able to do with your office? Yeah, well, we're busy. You know, day one, there's a big grant um, application due, and we've got a few more. We're throwing our hat in the ring and conceiving really competitive projects for these grants that are coming our way. So grant funding is one way to pursue it. It's not necessarily the most sustainable. Uh, so we're looking for sustainable sources and really understanding, you know, how can we how can we grow sustainably? That's really the key, is to, to grow the resources. The other main point, I use the word resources very deliberately. It's not just about money, but it's also about other kinds of resources, human resources, space, public spaces, maybe um, right-sizing some of the regulations so that we can allow things to flourish. And that in and of itself is a role that government can play to that isn't necessarily about uh, writing a check. All right, well, Julie Burroughs, thanks you, thank you for coming. Do you like the title Art Star? You know what? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I had a feeling you would say that. Well, thank you for coming. We'll continue this discussion over the many years of your tenure, thanks. I'm sure. Thank you. I appreciate it.